trillions on instruments of war and warfare, but you know, spending that on peace education, peace development, and, and the greening of the planetary uh, economy away from a military economy. So that was a brilliant um, contribution. David Adams actually turns out to live in France, which is the last bastion of intellectuals, it seems to me. Uh, David, although he's an American, and he looks like Abraham Lincoln, I have to say. He's got the same beard. Great man. Um, and it was a brilliant talk. Then we heard from Sean English, <clears throat> who is an Irish uh, chap um, living at Kildare, just outside Dublin, where St. Bridget founded the great you know, school of uh, ministry. And the Kildare flame has been burning pretty much ever since. Crazy English colonists tried to put it all out, but it's come back. The order of Bridgetine nuns is still going. And um, so Sean English has spoken uh, before at events I've been at in Ireland. <clears throat> and we worked on the Truth and Reconciliation Commission for Ireland and Britain together. Um, it came at an interesting time in Irish history when the Irish government is... There'd been an election, but no government yet appointed. And actually, as a Green, uh, Sean had, you know, the responsibility of voting. Uh, well, the Greens have now gone into a coalition with um, <clears throat> the two sort of centre parties to create a kind of coalition government. And um, they've got lots of concessions and a couple of cabinet members for the Greens. Um, Sinn Féin isn't happy because they, they won a lot of seats, and, but they made a mistake of not standing in enough seats around the country. So, or they probably would have won a majority. Um, so it's, it was interesting. And Sean talked about Irish politics, history, um, and the, you know, the bigger picture because he, he ran the Peace Theories Commission for the International Peace Research Association. And he also um, <clears throat> was the director of peace studies for the Sarah Osgold Mahera, which is the Free University of Ireland. I spoke at several of their meetings, and he was in charge of that whole unit. Um, the Free University of Ireland is, is a great experimental, a bit like an open university, um, and a bit like my Global Green University. They're kind of parallel projects. So... Um, and Sean knows a lot of intellectuals throughout Ireland. Um, and he spoke from his you know, deep knowledge about uh, Irish culture and history and philosophy. His own PhD is on the history of peace thinking um, and philosophy in, uh, globally, not just in Ireland. Then we had a brilliant talk um, <clears throat> by um, a chap called David Swanson, who spoke... Um, he could only give us 20 minutes, but he was uh, off in Charlottesville in Virginia, I think. He runs a thing called World Beyond War Organization. And he's a very active peace campaigner, a, a salt of the earth chap. Um, and he's been writing books. He has a brilliant website. He's been giving talks all over the media in America. He could only give us the 20 minutes because he had to go off and do a live interview on American radio. But his vision is very, very similar to me. He reminded me of a kind of... He reminded me, it's like, this is me in, in another incarnation. David has done the sums. He knows that war is completely, utterly ridiculous. We're spending... America is bleeding itself into poverty because of its military overspend. Every dollar of American tax money, 53 cents, goes to the military-industrial complex. And only 15 cents goes to social development and investment, education, health, and so on. America is, is destroying itself over militarism. And what's it getting in return? Nothing. It spent trillions on this war in Afghanistan. What's it got? Nothing. Um, you know, it's hated now more than it used to be. The same with its intervention in Iraq. That was a complete catastrophe. And, 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 you can list all, Libya, you know, and we don't have to go back, but you can also mention Vietnam. Um, America has this culture of war embedded in it since revolutionary times. I spoke last night to somebody in, um, in Lexington, where the whole thing broke out, very close to Walden Pond, where Thoreau used to write, um, who wasn't speaking in the conference, but who was 
you know, part of the team. And um, there is a streak in American culture that is peace-loving. Thoreau was a very learned man in, in Oriental philosophy. Civil disobedience, yes, but non-violently. Um, and there is that tradition, you know, Martin Luther King didn't say, take up your gun and attack at people. He said, no, demonstrate peacefully, as Gandhi did, for your rights. That's what Joan Baez argued in the 60s, the peace movement in America, Bob Dylan and Joan Baez and all the rest. That's what, that's what they stood for. Anyway, David was speaking from that tradition, and he's a, a genius. I think he should win the Nobel Prize for Peace if he pulls it off. Uh, he's been nominated several times. And he has a passion and a conviction uh, based on his study of the economics and the politics of peace and war in the culture of America. Um, he was able to give some good news. Some Congress people in America have just put forward a bill to shift billions of dollars from military spending to peace spending. Um, it's very similar to my Nonagon project to build a, a Department of Peace on physically on top of the Pentagon to show the Pentagon types that, hang on, peace has come, we are taking over here, and give half the budget the Pentagon currently gets to the Nonagon. Um, so that's an idea that I hope David will approve of and, and run with. Um, but yeah, his, his talk was brilliant, and thank you, David, for, for joining us. Um, then we heard from a political philosopher, an interesting historian whose work I've known for years, a man called Peter Marshall. Um, and he's written a, a number of books that were very relevant, and that's why I asked him to speak. Um, he's written a wonderful book about a, a sailing voyage he made from the Orkney Islands all the way to Malta, stopping at spots along the coast and visiting um, the megalithic sites, the stone circles and so on. Now his argument was that <clears throat> he'd proved that the people of Orkney, who were great megalith builders and built Scarbray and some of the earliest inhabitations in Europe, were culturally from the same people as had built the goddess temples of Malta. There's a continuity. And they could have traveled around using the sea and the rivers between each site. And therefore it wasn't sort of, you know, they weren't ignorant of each other's um, presence. He's also been to Chatel Huyuk, which is another great Neolithic uh, center in Turkey from the same kind of era, even earlier. And, um, <clears throat> and they've also found at um, Gobekli Tepe, a new temple from, from very early on in south um, eastern Turkey, which he's also been to. Now, so he shared about his perspective on this culture, which was largely peaceable. These people didn't have defences. There were no walls around their towns or their sacred sites. Stonehenge was never walled in, nor was Avebury. These people somehow had a sophisticated enough culture to deal with conflict, to deal with problems that always arise when human beings come together, and to deal with it peaceably. And... Um, so he, he saw the megalithic culture as a kind of utopian experiment in early human cooperation, which had got sidetracked by Iron Age warrior types coming in and, and muscling in and taking over, which was Monica Sajou's point, you know, the whole um, tradition of Ryan Eisler and so on, that, that military technology enabled elite warrior classes to then control and take over which then developed into you know, the, the warring classes of the Greek city-states and the Roman state, Roman Empire, eventually, um, <clears throat> from which our modern states in Europe have descended. So our job is to somehow deconstruct this, this process of history. Now, another great book that Peter's written, uh, which I have and value greatly, is called Demanding the Impossible. It's a social history of the philosophy of anarchism in, in political philosophy which was associated with Kropotkin, Tolstoy, Gandhi, Proudhon, and other thinkers, um, Thoreau to some extent, that, that, that uh, Marshall talks about. Also, William Godwin, um, who was the father of Shelley's love, you know, Mary Godwin, um, <clears throat> and, um, and Shelley knew, knew 
the father as well, and was influenced. So Shelley also really is an anarchist, who set up a commune in Wales, uh, a kind of hippie commune. When I was living in Wales, I researched all this because I'm a great fan of Shelley. And he was trying to do a hippie peace love commune way back in the you know, early 1800s. He went on to write Prometheus Unbound and many visionary poems. He was a pacifist and he opposed the the using of the French Revolution as an excuse to ramp up militarism. He wasn't on the side of you know, Napoleon, he wasn't on the side of um, Robespierre and the terrorists. He was, he was saying we need a revolution of peace. We need a revolution of conscience and of love. Um, I agree with him, you know, and and so does Peter Marshall, who wrote this amazing book. So he spoke about all that very movingly, very articulately. He's a learned man. He's also written about alchemy and Taoism and um, you know other related mysteries. So and also a very good book on astrology, which I've got. It turned out Peter was he wasn't at the Battle of the Beanfield, but he was at um, the Windsor Free Festival, which happened around the same time. And what Peter was able to tell us was that that too was set on by the police in a most horrific manner. They were just going to Windsor to celebrate peace, love and, and enlightenment and smoke the odd joint. And um, the police attacked them one dawn and smashed all their tents up. And the, the local farmer, um, also to drive them out, in the neighbouring field, which is a cornfield, had, had dumped hundreds of tonnes of faecal matter from cows, you know, uh, waste, sludge, which stank to high heaven. So why, why were people being that aggressive to these, these peace and love activists, you know? That was something Peter Marshall could speak about from personal experience. He was there. And his first ever written piece was in The Guardian, was about that incident. Um, I remember from my youth hearing about that incident. Um, so, yeah, and so he was able to talk about, let's say, the wider politics behind state control of power, which then gives the police the right to, you know, beat you up or do a George Floyd murder. You know, the state authorised that policeman to do that killing in America, just as it authorised the people to do the Battle of the Beanfield and arrest all these hippie types. Well, can't we have a different kind of state? Can't we have a decentralised state? A state that is a bit more intelligent? That doesn't rely on naked power of policing? My friend Satyan Raja since then has posted another video of a guy in Naropa, which is a university founded by Chogyam Trungpa, a Buddhist I greatly admire. You know, Chogyam Trungpa's Cutting Through Spiritual Materialism was one of the first books that made me sit up and go, wow, okay, if you haven't read it, you should. <laughs> published by Shambhala Press. And um, that was my kind of Bible, you know, at the time. It was like a map to enlightenment, right? And uh, anyway, Chogyam went to the States after founding Sammy Ling, which I've spoken at and know love well in Scotland. He then went to Colorado and founded the Naropa Institute, which is a great Buddhist university. And, you know, amazing Illuminati have spoken there. Um, it's not far from where Ken Wilber lives. And... Um, this guy, he was just, he was a student at Naropa who was working part for his rent and stuff, doing odd jobs around the campus. And he was picking up trash with one of those things that, you know, like a lever and you pull the thing and it picks up. And this policeman appears out of nowhere and challenges him, you know, who are you? And he tells him, like, I, I live here, I work for Naropa. And the policeman hassles and hassles and hassles, demands ID, demands, you know, photo ID, demands ID with an address, won't let him go. He's like a terrier. Yap, yap, yap. And and he's almost going to arrest the guy. You know, he tells him to put his pick a, pick a trash stick up. You know, put it down. He, he accuses him of using it as a threatening weapon. I mean, he makes up all kinds of stuff in his head. That policeman was in a psycho bubble all of his own. Exactly the same psycho bubble that the policeman that killed George Floyd was in. Now, from Peter Marshall's perspective, from, from the detangling of, of, of this state power, why have we ended up where policemen think they've got that right? 
I, it's been done to me. I've, I once had a car stolen off me by police in Scotland who were as aggressive and rude and violent and threatening. And um, it ended up in my favourite best ever car being literally stolen. They took it to a compound and trashed it. Uh, it was the best car I've ever had. And I didn't have a lawyer. I didn't know how to fight them. And I didn't have the money to reclaim, you know, from, from the compound. Um, and it was the dead of winter and I just had been diagnosed with a heart problem from, from a doctor. So, yeah, I know how nasty the police are. And so, anyway, Peter Marshall's talk was absolutely brilliant. Um, you know, you should listen to it. Um, then we had a talk from um, uh, a druidess, uh, Alex Spurway from Avebury, who lives just outside Avebury. She's active in the Druid Order of Avebury another dear friend and colleague of, of Terry Dobney. And um, she's also a member of my Druid Peace Order, which I run from now from here in France. Um, and, yeah, has thought a lot about, about the role of Druids and peacemaking. She herself has worked with um, uh, veterans who've been in the military in Britain. And she lives in a part of Wiltshire where there's a lot of military activity and just up the road from Porton Down and so on. I mean, the military act like they own Salisbury Plain. I think that one of the reasons I'm asking for a spiritual um, Stonehenge pilgrimage centre is is a symbolic way of saying, no, actually the people own Salisbury Plain. And we are the people. We are the peace lovers. We are the guy at Naropa Institute just picking up trash, doing a job. And we're saying to you, police and military types, back off, that's enough. You know, we want to get on with life, love and liberty. And that, you know, was the point of the Stonehenge Festival in the beginning. And long may it last for another thousand years. So anyway, my proposal is the MOD should give us 10 acres of land on a peppercorn rent. We'll pay, you know, a shilling a year for the next 999 years. The lease can be drawn up. And, and on that land, we, the pagan community, the Druid community, will build like a wood hen structure. This is a vision that Tim Sebastian, a great Druid friend of mine, who's no longer with us, also had. He wanted to rebuild wood henge. So we do it, made of wood. It's got um, space for people to stay overnight, like pilgrims. It's got a bookshop. It's got, I want a little observatory there where it's got telescopes and we can watch the sky at night. It's got a cyber calf. You can do your internet stuff. And it's got a beautiful central communal space open to the sky for um, fires, storytelling, bardic work, music of an evening. And it will be open 365 days a year, manned 24-7 by us, the community. And each grove or, or druid lodge or whatever around the country could volunteer to man it for a week on a calendar or a few days. And there'd be a core staff there all the time who would be, you know, um, funded um, by grants we'd raise the money yeah. and this would be wonderful I want it within like a few miles of Stonehenge itself so um, anyone that wants to help manifest that dream of mine and, and Tim Sebastian and George Fursoff please get in touch um, and let's do it you know and if you happen to know the Minister of Defence uh, then that would help because they have the um, the power to authorise some land to be released to that project um, it seems to me that would be a good signal from Britain as well, that we're not just some military carrier of nuclear weapons. We're actually nice people that believe in love, peace and liberty. And, you know, the Beatles uh, tradition, as well as, uh, you, know, um, you know, the SAS and, yeah, fearsome warriors. But actually, it's our spiritual warriors that should be taking control. So that's what Alex talked about anyway, and um, she gave a lot of detail on her journey and yeah, what, what, what Druidry means to her. She, it was a very good talk, you must listen to it. Um, then we were joined by a bard, a wandering bard called Kevan Mannering, who I've known for many years. He used to be the bard of, of uh, Bath, a friend of Tim Sebastian's as well, and who lived in Bath. And Kevan is a great man, he's... he's um, just finished a PhD in in the bardic transmissions of music from the Celtic world to the Appalachians. 
and he's now working in academia. He's lectured at the University of Leicester, now at the University of Winchester. And he's living very close to Avebury. I didn't realise. I thought he was living in Stroud. He gave us a brilliant talk about pilgrimage in, in the pagan world, pagan pilgrimage. Um, he didn't realise, of course, <laughs> I gave a talk about exactly the same theme two years ago to the European Pagan Academic Network. Um, but he, he, unlike me, has based it more on experiential stuff because Kavan is a long-distance walker. He loves to go for 100, 200 mile walks. Um, and he's been exploring all the different pilgrimage sites and pilgrimage routes of, of Britain and Scotland. And he's trying to invent new pilgrimage routes. So he's just done a walk from uh, Glastonbury to Avebury, um, which he just finished a few days before joining us. Um, and he's trying to develop new pilgrim routes. Of course, it's difficult now with lockdown, but you know, once we come out of lockdown, his vision is that the route from uh, Glastonbury to Tintagel would become a famous pilgrim route. And as, as much as, say, the Canterbury Tales from you know, Westminster to Canterbury. Um, so, yeah, and he's a bard, he's a poet, a, a novelist, a song, songwriter and singer and performer. So he gave us a, a delightful talk. Um, he also didn't realise my own daughter was doing a PhD on pilgrimage and poetry um, at Cambridge University. So, you know, I'm hoping those two will connect. Um, and my daughter's focusing mainly on Wordsworth. And what I didn't know, Kavan told me, is that Wordsworth was a really great walker. He clocked up about 40,000 miles of walks in his life, apparently. Um, but I, I, you know, I also walked around Grasmere and, and Cumbria, where Wordsworth lived. It's a very beautiful part of the world. <clears throat> but he also knew France here very well. And then we came to our final talk, uh, concluding session, um, and we are very honoured to have Reverend Liz Theoharis speak to us. Now, she's a Christian minister um, with connections to the Union Theological Seminary in New York, which I visited and spent time studying there. Um, she is the chairwoman, co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign, which is a grassroots movement across America for reclaiming the dignity and the rights of poor people. You see, the thing about militarism is that it actually impacts on people's lives. It's not just, okay, you, you look at a figure like 54 cents of every dollar goes to the military, and that only leaves a small amount for social expenditure. Well, that, that impacts on the quality of life of people in the States. People are getting poorer and poorer all the time. And she gave us a barrage of figures and life stories. Um, and Liz had been working busily all weekend. She could only take out a bit of time to join us, but I was very grateful she did. They'd been organising a digital uh, march on Washington, a, a million people making a, making a march on Washington, based on the work of Martin Luther King. You see, he, he realised the connection between militarism and poverty. And Martin Luther King, back in the 60s, campaigned against both, particularly black poverty, because the black community in the States are in the front line of poverty, and they still are. And so they'd been organising hearings and, and, and speak-ins in churches throughout the country um, where people were giving testimony normal, just ordinary, decent Americans who've fallen on hard times, can't pay the rent, get evicted, homeless, you know, etc., etc. And the same stories are coming up again and again. And it is heartrending. I watched it. They were having a marathon, just as we were having. We were having our 24-hour peace festival marathon. They were doing it in the same states with a million people involved, giving stories. And the chair of that, Liz, spoke at, to conclude ours. And it was very moving, you know. I don't think you can, you must have a heart of stone to not care about the situation of what's going on in America. And it's going on in every country, it's not just America. Um, I was born in Canada, you know, the social cohesion of Canada is better than the States. There's not that sort of cutthroat polarisation between, you know, the Trump right wing and, and, and others. It's... 
somehow Canada's got a more egalitarian feel, um, and long may that last. And I hope that the Amer poor American people can realise the error of their militarism. Um, so I also was, um, yeah, I was reflecting on um, a talk I'd heard recently about, about Russian um, <clears throat> culture, because as a philosopher I'd obviously been to Moscow, I'd been coordinating philosophers of peace, and I think I might have mentioned it in my talk actually, uh, I haven't summarised that, you, you can kind of listen to it, um, what really brought the Soviet experiment to an end was its being forced to spend so much money on militarism. Because the Soviet Union was trying to match America dollar for dollar with, or ruble for dollar, with every like weapon they invented, Russia had to have as well. And, and the Americans were able to outspend them. And Russia went bankrupt. There was no money for normal people doing normal things. And it was the same, you know, 50% of everyone in employment at the end of the Soviet Union was working for the military. That was the figure that, that I learned in a talk recently. And that's why Gorbachev said, no, enough is enough. We are just unilaterally going to end this Cold War and disarm. And he managed to talk Reagan into a disarmament process. The trouble is America never really got the point because it never faced that, that apocalyptic moment that Russia did. It's doing it now. This is America's wake-up call. The lesson that Liz was sharing with us, and that I 100% concur with, is that America has to realise, as David Swanson had said, it cannot afford militarism anymore for itself as a culture, nor for the planet. All it's buying with this vast expenditure is more insecurity, more hatred by other nations that resent its bullying ways, and, and no peace, you know, one of the quotes that, that the Poor People's uh, March was using, and they're, they're quite uh, several amazing vicars are running the thing. Liz is just one of them. Well, quotes from Isaiah about, well, what are you doing, you elites? You're just passing unjust laws, illegal laws. But God is, God is on your track. He's going to get you. He's, he's, he's clocking what you're doing, right? This quote from Isaiah is one of their, one of their texts they've been using. And that's true of what U.S. Congress is doing, what Trump is doing with his executive orders, you know. Uh, so anyway, it was a real interesting uh, note to end on because we were a peace uh, festival and we heard from one of the most important peace initiatives on the planet right now, this Poor People's Campaign. <coughs> and one of their central demands is to end militarism. Um, and, you know, hats off to them. Um, yeah. So, thank you, Liz. She gave a brilliant talk, and then that was the end of the festival. Then it was sundown. We'd gone the twenty-four hours, um, with only a couple of little breaks, and I gave a final little summing up talk, um, <clears throat> and it was sundown, and we couldn't go on because Zoom gives you the twenty-four hours, and that's it. So look, um, yeah, it was awesome. Is all I can say. I. I I was deeply honoured to host this event and all these brilliant speakers. I hope you listen to them all. Um, I was grateful to Michelle Little who, who contacted me about three weeks ago and said, Thomas, will you organise this, help organise this? We agreed that I would do the intellectual bit, the academic bit, she would do the music bit. And, um, you know, so I'm grateful for her spur because... It was that that got me, you know, to, to focus on it. And I think I'm going to do this annually from now on. I think um, peace is so important. We, we can't let these military types get away with that anymore. And the amount of world expenditure that's going on is, is unacceptable. Um, I think the, the event I was at where we were talking about Russia was the International Peace Bureau which my Philosophers of Peace group is a member of, and we were having an online discussion about peace history um, with some of the key people in the International Peace Bureau, which was set up in 1891. It's the main body that campaigns for peace around the planet. Um, oh, it's a network of networks, effectively. 
So, um, okay, that's, that's what I wanted to say there. This is a book I wrote about Druidry, uh, which explains about the peace teachings of Druids. The reason I set up the Druid Peace Order is to, you know, combine the work of poets and bards and Druids and seers and, and sages and bring us to focus on peace um, for all the reasons that I think hopefully are self-evident from the talk I've just given. I want to acknowledge today is also an important day for the Christian world. Today is um, 28th of June. Today is the day of St. Irenaeus, who is from Lyon, a city just down the road I know and love well. And Irenaeus was an interesting man um, who came originally from Smyrna or Izmir in Turkey. And um, I want to share a little bit about him, just reflection from a Christian perspective, um, because he's one of the most interesting of, of theologians of the early church, <coughs> and he has a direct link back to St. John, uh, the evangelist, because Irenaeus uh, was a disciple of Polycarp, um, and Polycarp was a disciple of John the Apostle. So Irenaeus was a recipient of teachings that probably went back to St. John the Divine, um, and he was a great believer in, you know, the, the, the Baraka, the transmission of grace through the church. He was a great lover of the Gospels and, um, you know, the, the core pay, um, pared down teachings of the church. He's famous for his um, Against the Heresies, which was a great uh, text. Um, he lived from 130 to 200 AD, so before the church was officially acknowledged, it was still pretty much an underground movement, um, and people were still being killed and you know, persecuted. Um, <clears throat> I don't... I understand where he's coming from with his, with his attack on heresies. I don't... I think that with hindsight, he might have written his book a slightly different tone. Um... And that some, with my work setting up the Mary Magdalene Studies Association here in France, I think one has to adopt a slightly more tolerant approach to alternative interpretations of Christianity. You know, Gnosticism is its own tradition. Valentinus had some good points, as Giles Crispell pointed out, a great Dutch scholar of Gnosticism who influenced and inspired my work. And um, I think that... You see, when Irenaeus lived, there was no uh, Nag Hammadi. They didn't know the Gnostic Gospels. They didn't know the Gospel of Thomas. Um, and I think if Irenaeus had had time to reflect, you know, if he'd been given a professorial chair at the University of Leiden or something, he would have realised that actually we're all in the dark. We're just holding candles out, trying to help lead the way. And yes, the church has a kind of mainstream path, but it shouldn't be so dismissive of other people's types of religious experiences. Or you end up with the situation of the Battle of the Beanfield. You know, we're the good guys. We support the police. Let's trash those deviants, hippies, you know. Uh, that's, that's the danger of this polarised way of thinking. If we have an inclusive way of thinking, then... You know, everybody's orthodoxy is somebody else's heresy and vice versa. And let's, let's become a bit more philosophical and let's look at the evidence, let's study it. Let's subject, you know, some of the claims of pseudo-gnosis are ridiculous. Well, let's subject them to empirical, you know, evidential um, assessment and that becomes obvious. But then what about the claims of the so-called orthodox or Catholic Church? Some of its claims are a bit dubious, and maybe they need to be subjected to a bit of, you know, a bit of science, a bit of historical reason. Um, so I think if we, the solution is to become more philosophical in our approach. Wherever we are on the spectrum, whether we're Protestant, Catholic.